Hello, welcome to another episode of the Veterans Corner. My name is Chuck Wood and I'll be your host. Joined by my co-host, Megan Dooley. Megan, hey, great welcome to welcome back. Um, this show here is, actually we've been trying to get this individual on for, for quite some time now. Uh, it's gonna be a real interesting show. Some of you might recognize him from the, from the TV himself. Uh, you, you've, you've been on uh, national television yeah. on one of the shows. Uh, we have Brian Evelidge, uh, Reverend Brian Evelidge, uh, with us. Now, Brian, actually, we have a past. Uh, we yes, worked we together uh, with the state for a number of years. Uh, we haven't seen each other. It's got to be a good 16, 17 years. Probably that, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's great to see you again. Well, thanks uh, for having me out. You know, we, we, me and Donna, have try, we've talked about having you on, and uh, it's just putting the pieces together. Uh, scheduling and all that. Well, as Reverend, I believe in divine timing, so this is when it was supposed to happen. It, it was meant to be. Uh, Brian's going to be talking, he actually, he's, he's the founder and president of Forging Foundations Incorporated, and you're going to learn what all that is. First, I'd like to mention, we were talking about this earlier, this show, as I found out today, we've taped a uh, little over 250 episodes so far since 2013. That's wow. phenomenal. Awesome. Yeah, that's, uh, I thought we were in a 200 range, but it's actually been 250. Time flies, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Well, well, I don't know about that, but uh, yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> it does. I mean, that's, it, it, it's 250 shows that we've gotten out to the viewers, the public, the veteran community. Um, if Donna didn't tell you what the show is about, it's, it's the mission statement here is to expo give exposure to any organization, foundation, group, anyone that provides a service to the veteran community. Uh, there's so many out there that, that do uh, provide for the veteran community and our goal is to get their word out. Awesome. So, well. um, Brian, welcome. Welcome, it's an honor to have you here. You're, you're a Navy veteran. Yes, I am. I was a Navy corpsman from uh, 1982 to 1986 uh, with a specialty as an operating room surgical tech. I joined the Navy to see the world and got stationed a two hours drive from home. I grew up in New Jersey and ended up stationed in Connecticut, so uh, didn't have as dramatic of a service time as most. Yeah. Um, but there were, uh, you know, in the operating room, you certainly do have your stressors yeah. and your uh, wrangling with life and death. Yeah. So it was an intense time. Yeah. Well, on behalf of the viewers, us here at the Veterans Corner, we want to thank you very much for your service. Well, I appreciate that. It seems a lifetime ago. Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, actually, we overlapped by one year. I was 79 to 83 in the Navy. So it, 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 it does seem like a lifetime ago. It was a lifetime it ago. It was, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's, let's dive right, right into this, Brian. I, I, it, there's so much in... One thing I had mentioned to the viewers that you've been on, you, you've been on TV. Yes, I, uh, I had the opportunity to be on the History Channel program Forged in Fire. Yeah. Uh, with just less than a year's experience, I got called to be on. And the exposure for that brought people my way that were looking for some instruction. And uh, so it turned into a business. And from that business launched the nonprofit that I run. And they work hand in hand. And actually the business is funding the nonprofit right now. Yeah, is, is, there, is there anything else you'd like to share as far as you know, uh, the, the business and the nonprofit itself? I mean, tell us a little bit about, about the business. Sure, so initially I was just a, a custom knife maker. Uh, they use the term bladesmith on TV, but technically the proper term is cutler. Because okay. yes. you're making cutlery. And uh, from there, blacksmithing and bladesmithing became a, a hobby that grew into a, a training school. I have uh, Evelich Metalworks Metal Art Education Center in Wolcott, and uh, we do uh, paid classes for customers, one, one in a lifetime, bucket list, people come out just to do something. Some people come weekly just to uh, learn the trade. And uh, I spent a lot of time, I have nine or so people that come every Monday night, uh, four of them out of the Forging Foundation's referral. So we do a lot to teach them how to uh, forge steel and in the process we forge friendships and it's a safe environment for folks to come out and sort of live life together. Yeah. Nice. 
And that's phenomenal. You said that it is divine timing, that one stint on the History Channel has led to all this, and now you're on our show. So I'm curious to hear what your attachment is with veterans. Well, having, uh, having been in the service myself, um, my first exposure on active duty was with a senior chief who was a prisoner of war during Vietnam. Oh, wow. And uh, you could see the difficulty that he had navigating life all the way back then. And um, I've had many friends who've done careers in the service, even though I only did a short stint. So I've stayed in touch with some of them. And I see their adjustment issues uh, coming back into society. And uh, my best man, actually, all three of his sons are Marines on active duty. So there's a, a passion for me to still want to stay connected to the military culture. And uh, I have a lot of veterans that I've encountered that really are battling some issues. And so giving them a place to uh, be safe. You know, a lot of environments, if they disclose their stress on things, they become mandatory reporting situations. Whereas in my sort of non-credentialed environment, it's very casual and they feel free to share things that they might not otherwise do. And um, I don't want to disclose too much, but I've got a man who's been coming to the shop who has gone from not leaving his home for an extended period of time to actually being involved in community theater now. So it's been quite a, a blossoming of just seeing it. It's nothing me specifically. It's just spending time and living life together. Yeah. And forging just gives us the common ground to be able to do that, because it's a cool activity. It is, and also what you're doing is a great service. As you mentioned, that veteran who couldn't leave his house, and now he has found a community, not only in your, your programs, but he has stepped out and he's moved outside of his, what, what he thought was his comfort zone, and now he's found a whole new community. But I want to dig into the meat of the issue here, is that you have a veteran-specific PTSD program. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, so there is a lot of study, a lot of uh, surveys have been done showing that artistic activities create new neural pathways that allow people to kind of navigate around some uh, emotional and even mental blocks and some stressors. And so by actually having people come out and engage in an artistic activity like forging, which is kind of a masculine activity, although I have plenty of females that come through the program, uh, it, it's kind of a way for them to tap into a part of their brain chemistry that doesn't normally get utilized. And so as they're working on something that's creative, not only do they get to uh, experience something different, but also in the process, they're getting to see discarded things, damaged things, uh, mm -hmm. things that have been rusted and written off, transformed into something new and usable, which has its own intrinsic message for somebody who's battling post-traumatic stress issues, mm -hmm. that there's a redemptive process in it for them. And they can be transformed into something new and useful. And uh, it caters to the minister side of me as well to be able to kind of convey that message. I'm curious, so was that a deliberate or was that a symbolism that you found after you started the blacksmith program? I, I normally teach using object lessons, so my brain's always looking for something that can convey a message. Uh, and in this case here, we kind of use old, really rotty, uh, r rotten looking railroad spikes mm -hmm. as that initial class, because they're bent, they're rusted, they're deformed. And yet when they're finished, they're nice and straight. They've got a twisted handle and a nice sharp edge. And so it really is a very good illustration. In three hours, it can be accomplished to see something discarded turned into something fully useful and purposeful. That's incredible. Nice. You know, re rejuvenated. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's kind of a rebirth in a sense. And for some of the folks that are coming out, they don't see a transition into uh, normal civilian life. Mm -hmm and they, they don't see a purpose and value. So, so kind of getting them to see beyond what they are and where they're at to where they could be is really the object lesson that comes out of that class. It's very hands-on and, and it, I guess, stimulates the brain in a way that they could see themselves. And as you said, it's, it is a rebirthing process. So what do you use the, the spikes for or what you forge afterwards? Well, if people want to get involved in more, we can do more elaborate projects. Historically, a railroad spike would have been used in the Old West to make a knife that at night the ranch hands and farm hands would use. They'd strike firewood with another piece of firewood on the backside of that railroad spike blade and split firewood and make kindling. So it was just kind of a way for them to stay warm and keep coffee going at night. 
But there's really, I think, a message even in that because even a simple mundane task has value. It provided warmth. It provided them with the ability to stay awake, uh, to, to ward off predators in the field. And so getting people to understand even simple little things like a, you know, a $1 spike being transformed. And the spike knife represents both a civilian culture and a military culture because edge weapons are utilized for combative purposes, but knives are tools. Yeah. They're necessary for cooking, they're necessary for camping, they're necessary sometimes to just tighten a flat-headed screw on a, on a light switch. So it's giving them an item that sort of captures their past and their future in the same item. And uh, I just think that's really cool. It resonates with a lot, uh, about 80% are one and dones. They come to the program and that's it. But some of them come back and they want to learn more. And so then it becomes almost a uh, mentoring program for the skill set. But some weeks we don't even forge. I'll just get pizzas and we'll just talk about life. That's, that's really, really thought provoking that they get to bring back something that represents so much to them. Yeah. And also it leads the, opens the door to that community. Going back to that veteran who has now been able to find another home in the theater. Yeah, and uh, some of them have sent me really uh, heart-wrenching testimonies of the impact that it's had. So to some people listening, it may just be making a knife. But to people who have been through that and have actually seen the rebirthing process in that, it does convey to them that there's hope. Um, I, I have a series of items I make through my for-profit business called the End the 22. Uh, as most of us know, 22 veterans uh, take their own lives in our country daily, and that average has been remotely unchanged for probably 40 years it's now. It's actually uh, under underreported. Yeah, it is, and uh, I think a lot of them don't even feel that our nation cares about them yeah. in their state. So, uh, the end of 22 becomes uh, a funding mechanism. When I sell those, those actually help sponsor people to come through because nobody ever pays uh, if they're coming through as somebody with PTSD. And I've extended the scope to first responders during COVID. I had healthcare providers coming in that were getting slaughtered with work hours and dealing with uh, the passing of lives. And so PTSD is not relegated just to the military. It started as a veteran specific program. But uh, we, we've even decided to extend to Bristol PD the offer for all of them to be able to come through the program four at a time and uh, be able to come out and hammer away some stress. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure the people who come to your program appreciate that too. I'm hoping they take advantage of it. You know, it, it's, I mean, listening to you, Brian, uh, we, we, that's what the show is all about. We've had so many guests that, that are, they set out to do the same thing that you're doing in different ways. And I'm so happy that we, we, we were able to finally connect because this shows the viewers just another way of, of helping the veteran community and, and, and first responders. Yeah, I'd like the viewers to understand what they do may very well be a usable tool to accomplish the same thing I do. You know, I'm just using my trade, but there are other things. If you're being creative in your workplace, if you repair something, well, then that can be an object lesson to show that same message of hope to people that are battling post-trauma. Yeah. And, and we're, we're talking about first responders. The vast majority of first responders are veterans. Yeah, yeah, the statistics are, I, I'm involved in a study right now, and uh, I think it's something in the neighborhood of mid-60 percentile. Yeah. Wow. So. And that number has remained relatively unchanged, you would I, say, through? I, I don't know. I know when I worked in the department with Chuck, uh, I would say more than half of the people oh, that yeah. worked around us were active duty at some oh, point. Oh, it was probably close to 80 or 90 percent in that occupation. Uh, I, I know most of the people we worked with were veterans. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as a state employee, there are other perks being a veteran. Yeah. Uh, it gets added to state service time. So that's one of the attractions to bring people in yeah. uh, is they get credit sort of uh, added on to their state employment time, yeah. which is a nice op option for people. If I remember right, that was <clears throat> during wartime. Yeah. That's, I, I th and it's not active theater of warfare, it's if you're on active duty during wartime. During, yeah. So I ended up getting an extra two years of state service credit because yeah. there was 23 months worth of active combat during my four years. I, I think I've got maybe six or seven or something like that. They, did, they didn't count uh, 
actually, when I was in Beirut, they didn't count that, believe it or not. Uh, and, and, you might want to revisit that. I think yeah, it's been added. It's been added? I think it's been added, uh, yeah. But I mean, retiring, what, going on 17 years ago for me. Yeah, I'm out uh, 13. Yeah. But uh, what, uh, how, how is all this shown to be beneficial for the vets? I think we touched on that a little bit. L a little bit. Uh, one of the things I generally appreciate is when they walk away having had a great experience, they refer it to other people. Word of mouth, just like you were saying, having people on to get it out there. Yeah. Nobody really knows about this. Yeah. And yet there's a network of perhaps 100 blacksmith and bladesmith shops around the country doing similar programming. And um, it, it's nice to finally have a vehicle because I can link folks to this in other parts of the country and they can use the messaging as sort of a dialogue for them to have in their own communities. Uh, there's a lot of folks doing this and smithing is attractive uh, to the majority of military veterans because really, you know, there's a scripture verse that says you're supposed to turn your swords into plowshares. Uh, so transforming something old and previous into something new and usable is actually a biblical message that can also be conveyed. And I do have secular and uh, biblical based talking points depending on the interests of the person that's attending. Uh, website. Uh, I think they just had it on, 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 the, on the screen. Yep, it's, it's on, on the, the screen, screen right now. now. It's on yeah. the screen right now. Yeah. So primarily my, my for-profit business, evolichmetalworks.com, yeah. is the place they can go and in the search bar they can type in PTSD and it'll bring them to a page where somebody can sign up to come out. More importantly, they can share that with somebody so that they can go online. And there's even a mechanism there if uh, somebody wants to sponsor somebody to come through the program. So that's the primary link to do that. We're going to touch back on that toward the end of the show. All right. Uh, just we like to mention that a few times to really get the word out, to really get the viewers' attention on, and so they have that. Um, how many? Just out of curiosity, Brian, how many? How many participants do you? Is it? Is it very? It, it does. Um, there are other class options. Uh, people don't have the amount of time of three hours. Yeah. Uh, we can do something where we take half a horseshoe which is a smaller item, yeah. but it can be done in about an hour 20. So uh, I can have eight to 12 people for the smaller class, four to eight people for the larger group, although most of the time it's most effective when it's one-on-one. One-on-one, uh, one-on-two. -on -one, uh, I had a veterans group, excuse me, come through. They brought four people out to sample it before they brought the word back. Uh, I have four workstations, four anvils, and four forges. So normally on a busy day, I'll put four people at each, but on a good day, one person at each is ideal. Yeah. I remember in, in, in the Boy Scouts, I mean, we're talking a lifetime, we're talking two lifetimes ago. Yeah. Um, I actually made a knife out of a file. Do you still have it? I, I you know, I can't find it. It had the leather, it was from a belt, and then there was two pieces of brass on either end. Well, you need to make a new one then if you can't find it. Yeah. And we know a place now. We do. That's, we that, do. Th there you go. Uh, and what, five minutes away from each other? Yeah, there's something visceral about knives. Yeah. Uh, we had a co worker in the agency who passed away after a motorcycle accident. I'm and sorry for he your had, loss. He had two of my knives and he had three sons. And so when he passed. You said agency, D DOC? Yeah, DOC, yeah. yeah. And uh, his sons approached me to make a third one so that they all had one. Yeah. Because there's something about passing down granddad and dads to the next generation. So that, that item that you can connect to a task in life and use in your hand really does have a visceral yeah. kind of connection. Yeah, it does. And, and that's key. That's key. A lot, a lot of times there's so many different, if this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this right here might, might, might get them uh, and bring them in. And, and I like what you said earlier about, you know, some days you just, you don't do any work. You just sit there and bond. Right. And, 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 and it, there's nothing better than bonding with those that have been through similar situations that you have, you've been through. I'm a firm believer that you can't share truth with someone until you build trust. Yes. And so whether it's my ministry side or it's this PTSD program, trust building might take a long period of time. Yeah. Uh, especially if somebody's been through a significant trauma where, you know, they're very guarded. And so just time, uh, you know, sometimes quality time is a term, but sometimes quantity time is needed. Yeah. 
I'd like to go back a little bit from memory lane. When did you start this program again? Uh, 2018, I started doing what I'd heard other people were doing, but I created my own model. Um, my Forging Foundations nonprofit also works with at-risk youth. And so trying to find younger people that have been through trauma themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm currently in conversation with the Boys and Girls Club to create something similar for younger people because some of them have come across some pretty heinous uh, events in their lives at very young mm -hmm. ages. So it kind of grew from that role because I worked with young people in, in ministry after I left the agency. So I've moved from young to adolescent to now adults and people with post-traumatic events. It's all encompassing. So from the three years that you have started in this program, how have you continued to not only expand the word of it, but what are your expectations for in the future? Because I'm sure, like you, everybody has a five-year plan. I want to see what you imagine in your head should when you continue on with this program, this tremendous program. Well, the, the, the location is on my residential property, so space is small. Um, but I've recently been training up guys as apprentices that are being equipped so that they can be able to do the programs themselves. One of those young men is opening his own little shop, and so I want to see multiplication happen. Uh, more, more importantly than that, uh, I want to see people recognize in other trades that what we're doing, and I can write curriculum for them in their job skills so that it translates to what they do and start seeing people with other skill sets bring people into the fold and use carpentry, use plumbing. You know, if you're tearing out a rotten decking board, you know, you're kind of transplanting a corrupted part of someone's life that's been damaged and putting a new piece in. So the message translates to all sorts of things. Yeah. Just getting people that don't feel they really have the ability to do this to realize, no, you do. You just need somebody to sort of show you how. Yeah. And so I'd really like to be more of a train the trainer in a sense uh, I love working with people hands-on, but I'd much rather equip other instructors so that they can be doing this in their own places. It spreads out the help. Yeah, and well, many many hands makes the work life. Yeah, exactly. So, and many many trades provides more options. There might be somebody who smithing just doesn't interest them. Well, maybe cooking does. Yeah. You know, so let's let's get more people involved in providing the service through their own way, and just give them some structure that they can reproduce. Yeah. And, and showing them that with PTSD, as you said, it's the redirecting of the neural pathways. It's showing them that, yes, you are capable yeah. of making something beautiful with your hands. Let me show you how. And also you're infusing a faith-based perspective on it, whereas the religion that you practice is, it's all about love. It's all about acceptance, and it's about being a better version of yourself, and this is how you are going to help them find that. And in most cases, the one person not offering that grace and forgiveness is the individual themselves. So getting them to release their own baggage sort of liberates them to be able to pursue things. And even in a faith perspective, oftentimes the only person who doesn't forgive us is us. Yes. So that's a great that's message. All, that's usually the case. Yeah. So I try to convey that uh, through everything we do. And there's nothing you can do wrong with steel that can't be undone with a little more heat yep. and a little more pressure. Yep. And that's how life is, heat and pressure. Yep. So it's a great parallel. You know, we're actually, believe it or not, as all of our shows, they go by pretty fast, uh, 25 minutes. Wow. We, we got one question as far as knowing that there's no cost to the participant. Yeah. Is there any way that uh, someone can cover the participant's cost. Yeah, so, so right now I'm utilizing a percentage of my for-profit business to fund it, but if people wanted to sponsor a vet, they can actually go back to the website, evelichmetalworks.com, and if they do a search in the search bar for PTSD, there's a place where they can click on sponsor a vet or sponsor somebody with PTSD, and they can actually uh, online prepay to cover the costs for one person to come through the program fully. And, you know, and maybe they've got a family of vets and they want to send everybody out. Uh, you don't have to be fully immersed in PTSD to benefit from the activity of coming out and seeing something reformed. Mm -hmm. And so it'd be great, more people can be serviced if we have more individuals that are willing to sponsor somebody and actually give them the opportunity to come out. Make a great mm -hmm. gift. Hopefully this show uh, will give you that exposure. It's great to see you again. It really is uh, a lot of war stories, 
Um, couple. Yeah, yeah, just a, just a few. And you know, this right here, um, I, I'm sure the viewers have found this as interesting as we have. Um, I'm getting a word, we gotta go. That's it, uh, thanks again. I want, I'd like to see you back. Give us an update of, of what's going on. Maybe we can do a two-parter next time. Sure, we're doing a Veterans Open House in the spring. Okay, uh, we'll, have you, on, we'll have you on before that. Uh, thanks again, Brian. Thanks to the viewers for watching. Uh, good night from the Veterans Corner. Good night. Good night. Riverview Apartments is Bristol's two-time beautification award-winning residence community for adults age 55 and older. They offer one or two bedroom apartments with modern appliances, air conditioning, wall-to-wall -wall carpet and tiled floors. Both heat and hot water are included. Riverview also offers a wide range of activity rooms that include a billiard parlor and a spacious community room. It is handicap accessible with safe, secure parking for tenants and ample off-street parking for visitors. 860-940-6757 or riverviewbristol.com.